for February, so you can grab those ahead of time. But uh, if not, continue reading through the Bible. And uh, again, just a rich, rich opportunity. Uh, First John, guys, uh, we're going to start off there, as I said. Uh, but as, as we recalled earlier on in our study of First John, uh, John was advanced in age, guys. He was up there in age and ministering to a people really in danger of falling away from the steadfastness of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was a kind of a, a tough time. Remember that uh, since the time of Jesus, so many generations had already passed and uh, uh, the, the newness and the freshness, the excitement and the zeal of being with Jesus or walking with Jesus uh, may have kind of worn off. Uh, uh, it was a time that Paul and both Paul and Peter had been martyred for their faith. It was a time that uh, uh, people were moving on and people may have been uh, worshiping just out of habit, just out of routine. And rather than having that first love relationship, you know, many had drifted away from that. Uh, so John was, you know, really trying to stoke the fires and warn the people about this lackadaisicalness and really about uh, the false teachers that were coming in. Worldliness and love, bad attitudes were creeping into the, uh, creeping in along with these false teachers. And it all had brought in the danger of error by the church as, the, again, uh, their hearts may have grown cold. Their bodies might have been here. Uh, the, the, the Bibles might have been with them, but again, that, that uh, heartfelt relationship, that first love relationship had kind of been waning. But remember, John ministered to the churches in the areas of Asia, and the same letter of First John would be read by the same churches written to and about by, the, uh, by John and the Holy Spirit in the book of Revelation. Remember in the first few chapters of Revelation, he addressed seven of the churches and the letters were addressed specifically to this area of the world were kind of in a circle, a semi-circle. The churches were strategic throughout this area of Asia Minor, known as modern Turkey today. But First John paints a picture really of a loving father figure ministering tough love to a group given over to aberrant teaching and fleshly weaknesses. You know, John was that old grandpa, like, and he was uh, ministering in love, but sometimes love is tough. Sometimes it, it's that, uh, it's like that old grandma or that old auntie you have that says, hey, we got to have that heart-to-heart -heart talk because, you know, things are not going right. And they see and they kind of warn, and this is how John was. But, you know, rather than giving up, John wasn't saying that, hey, forget it, later with you guys. John was committed to urging back those who had been given over to uh, uh, had been given over more uh, to more worldly ways. And uh, while John was the apostle of love who ministered in tough situations, who was connected, uh, uh, who was committed to turn hearts in restoration back to the Lord, there were others who would rather cut than run. You know, there were that others would say, hey, I ain't bothering. I'm going to look and uh, find some place and some, somebody who's eager to hear the word of God rather than to minister to those hardened hearts. But let's take a look at Jonah today. We're going to look at Jonah. Food, you guys. Uh, I, even me, I'm in First John. I, I'm in First Peter, I should say. <laughs> well, we're going back to the minor prophet of Jonah this morning. Look in that little section uh, in the back of your Old Testament, right around Amos and uh, uh, Micah. Uh, you'll find the little book of uh, Jonah. Jonah. It's interesting to note that Jonah ministered in a time about 800 B.C., guys, about 800 years, seven or 800 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Israel was in a relative uh, time of upturn. You know, the, uh, the economy was going well. The 401ks might have been doing good. Interest rates were low, whatever it was. You know, Israel was in a relative upturn time of uh, situation. Confidence was relatively high. Prospects looked good. You know, there was a little bit of peace around the, the, the uh, warring fronts. And, you know, Israel has been so familiar with uh, 
going to war with so many and on so many different battlefronts. But Assyria at this time was in a mild decline, and the people were known by Israel as cruel tormentors and taskmasters. Remember Assyria along with its capital Nineveh was founded by Nimrod. You, you guys remember Nimrod? You, we're reading through the book of Genesis now. But uh, Nimrod, uh, well, you might be in Job, but you know Nimrod was the great grandson of Noah. And Nineveh for many years was the, the capital city of the mighty Assyria, uh, Assyrian Empire. And Assyria was always there uh, prodding and poking and tormenting the poor little nation of Israel. They were powerful. They would come in. They would take. They would... Uh, uh, take their goods, take their gold, take the, the women and children and carry them off as captives uh, to their own, uh, as, as, as their own. But uh, yet we see in Jonah, many centuries before the appearance of Jesus Christ, God's mercy and love reaching out to a lost world. Remember uh, uh, to Abram, he says that, hey, you're going to be a blessing to all the world, all the families of the world. From you will come a seed that is going to reach out and touch the world. And really the Lord was speaking of the coming and the birth of the Jesus Christ who would come to be the Savior of the world. But in chapter 1 of Jonah, verses 1 to 3, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship, which was going, uh, uh, going to Tarshish. He paid a fare and went uh, into it uh, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. See, you know, the Lord came. He gave an assignment to Jonah, the, pro the prophet, saying, hey, go to this, uh, this wicked city, the great city of Nineveh. And, and Nineveh was on that fer the fertile crescent uh, that we call in that part of the world. It was, you know, maybe about 500 miles northeast of, uh, of Israel and of Jerusalem. But as he made his way down to the coast and to the city of Joppa, uh, which is uh, along that Mediterranean coast, you know, uh, in, in close proximity to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem. But, you know, he says, hey, I'm booking passage to Tarshish. Here's I'm going across the very opposite way that the Lord is sending me. I'm going 2,000 miles to the west to uh, Tarshish, which is modern, modern day Spain today. So he says, hey, I'm booking passage. I'm ignoring the Lord. I'm going the exact opposite way of what God has called me and where God has directed me to go. Uh, in uh, verse 4, the Lord hurled a great storm on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so the ship was about to break up. The sailors became afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and they threw the cargo, which was in the ship, into the sea to lighten it uh, for them. And Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship and laid down and fallen uh, sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us, so we will not perish. And each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots, so we may learn on those who account this com uh, calamity has struck us. So they cast lots. The lot fell upon Jonah, and, and they said to him, Tell us now, on uh, whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And from what people are you? Ooh, a lot of questions, huh? These guys are nosy, like, hey, wow. But uh, uh, Jonah, uh, Jonah's ship shipmates were not fooled by Jonah's calm, but was revealed uh, to them by the casting of the lots. You know, they cast lots. The lot fell upon Jonah. But even though that lot fell upon Jonah, you know, by chance, by happenstance, uh, they asked him these, qu these tough questions. Uh, uh, why has this, uh, this calamity come upon us? What is your occupation? Oh, I'm a prophet of the Most High God. <laughs> and where is your country? I'm from the country of Israel. We're, uh, we're Hebrews, where the, the Lord God is the God over us. And uh, where are your people from? May we come from the land uh, 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 of Cain and given to us by the Lord. And you know, uh, uh, Jonah was calm, but again, he was revealed by the casting of the lots. You know, you can tell, uh, this guy was pretty calm, cool, and collected, because even in the midst of the storm, he slept soundly. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't fearful. In, in other words, he knew that he was in God's hands, 
And, you know, I, I want to say to, to us that, you know, so much uh, is implicated here in the story of Jonah. But I want to say that sometimes, e even in the, the stormiest situations, uh, God wants us to re rest and have his uh, our rest in him. And, you know, I know about sleepless nights, and sometimes we wake up, and sometimes we're praying, sometimes we bothered by this or that. And yet God wants to relieve us of that. And, you know, we, we, we pray. It might be a time of prayer. It might be a time of confession, repentance, whatever it might be. But again, uh, he went on in verse 9, and he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men became extremely frightened of verse 10, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he told them. You know, it wasn't like they had some divine word of knowledge, but Jonah was very transparent. He said, I'm running from the Lord. And, you know, apparently this has fallen upon us because God is trying to get uh, my attention. Unfortunately, uh, you're involved in this. And, you know, a lot of times when God is uh, uh, working in our hearts and lives, you, you might think that, oh, oh, it will be simple if this, this, and this happened. It will be simple if we could just uh, pray it away and, Lord, just take this all away. But sometimes that situation that we're going through, the person that we're dealing with, or whatever that situation is, they're there because of what? God wants to minister to our hearts and our lives. And this is exactly uh, where, where Jonah was at. The men knew that he was fleeing the presence of the Lord because he told them. And, and again, God was working. God was very interested. We can think of the all the, hundred, the 120,000 people that... Uh, Jonah would eventually minister to in the city of Nineveh, but it was really 120,001 that God was interested in because he was not only interested with the Assyrian people, but he was interested in working in the heart of the man Jonah. And, you know, whatever things are going on, it could be a bunch of heathens around us. It could be a bunch of backsliders, backstabbers, whatever it might be. God is still interested, you know, really in ministering to our hearts, uh, first of all. And, you know, we're in the midst of it. And he goes on uh, in 11, and he said to them, Why should we do this uh, that the sea might become calm? What should we do that the sea might become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will uh, uh, become calm. And for you, for I know on account of this great storm has come on, upon you. Uh, however, the men rowed desperately to return to land that they could not, but they could not because the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Uh, and, and they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not, uh, 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 do not uh, put, his, uh, put innocent blood on us, O thou, O Lord. Thou hast done as thou is pleased. And they picked, so they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. The sea stopped its raging. Then the men sacri uh, feared the Lord greatly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Uh, through a wayward and uncooperative minister of God, Jonah was taken seriously by his shipmates. They began to seek God in prayer. You know, they, they themselves had a, had a meeting with God. They themselves came to that place that, Lord, uh, uh, we're going to fear you, we reverence you, we give you all the honor and glory. We're going to make sacrifice to you, Lord. We're going to come to you and make vows to you. And I'm, I'm sure that vows said that, hey, we're going to commit our hearts and lives to you. But you see in verse 13, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them you know within the heart of man there's a there's a basic good within the heart of man they says that hey we're not willing to throw this man into this stormy sea within the heart of man they say hey let's try and get back to land that we can save all of ourselves and not have to throw this man jonah into the sea so within the heart of man there's a spark of goodness within the heart of man there's a spark that says, hey, we hope, and uh, we, even though we don't know this guy, we blame the guy for the storm we're in. We'd like to see him saved. But, you know, uh, it, it goes to show you that you cannot fight against God's perfect will. The harder they rode, the stormier the seas became. And at times, uh, like that lifeguard giving you the warning, hey, just go with the flow of the current. Don't fight the rip. Don't fight 
the current, just go with it. It's going to take you down the beach and then maybe you can get out a little bit past there, you know. Hopefully not, not in Kauai, but uh, <laughs> right down the beach. <laughs> but again, they called up to the Lord. And uh, uh, in, in 17, he says, the, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Then the, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out uh, my distress to the Lord. And he answered me. And I, uh, uh, I cried for help from the depths of Sheol, and he did hear my voice. For thou hadst uh, cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the currents engulfed me. Thy, thy, uh, thy breakers and billows passed over me. And I said, I have been expelled from thy sight. Nevertheless, I would look again toward thy holy temple. Water encompassed me from the point, uh, to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me, and weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of thy mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. Thou hast brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. In these uh, few verses, uh, uh, seven verses, guys, circumstances held Jonah to where he turned from his disobedience and returned to the Lord in prayer. You know, he was willfully disobedient. He just says, hey, later, God, I'm not going to uh, Nineveh. I'm going to Tarshish, I'm getting on this ship, and I'm getting as far away as I can from you. And when you think about it, some of the guys did the math. They said that hey, Nineveh was 500 miles journey, you know, quite a journey away from uh, Jerusalem. But, you know, Jop, uh, uh, Tarshish was even farther, 2,000 miles away. And not only that, you had to book passage, and the, the, the seas were often rough and often dangerous. And uh, uh, either way, it was a tough journey, but, you know, what, what God is calling us to, you got to hope and pray that we're hearing God, we're listening to Him, and we're going uh, as He directs. You know, some people might come all the way over from the East Coast, and uh, you, you wonder, why are you here? They, 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 they're coming from the East Coast, they're going to the Far East, and, you know, they said that you're going halfway around the world, and you got to hope and pray that as things uh, don't seem really to go their way, are they really going the way of the Lord? Are they really in the will of the Lord? Are they really uh, uh, following God's will? Or they, are they running from something back home? Are they running from some other problem? Are they running into some situation they think is better? But uh, uh, until God deals with it, you know, we're going, to, we're going to just take whatever we have, whatever we've carried around, whatever we put in our baggage and brought over with us, we're still going to have it as we unpack uh, wherever it might be. It might be in Nineveh, it might be in Tarshish, it might be in Honolulu, I, I don't know. But you know, some people have sought to, uh, sought to uh, seek the will of God and they felt they were in the will of God and we, uh, uh, we're not real sure. Uh, it, there was a lot of distress at times and uh, uh, you know, but it, circumstances held Jonah to where he turned from his disobedience and returned to the Lord in prayer. He says, I called, and, you know, I called out to the Lord. And, you know, I, I, I just looked at his communication. He says, I cried. You know, I called out to the Lord. I cried out to God. Hey, things, were, things were desperate. And I know that I had placed myself in this terrible situation. I know that I myself had put myself in a bad place outside of your perfect will. I said, you know, I have been expelled. I said, I will look towards you, Lord. And, you know, uh, it's, li it's like, hey, we were expelled from the presence of God. And, you know, that word expelled in my NESB, it kind of caught my eye because, hey, we never liked that word expelled. And, you know, I'm, I'm uh, far removed from school. But, you know, I know that, hey, when you got expelled from school, it was not good. And, you know, a lot of, lot of kids back then, hey, they got expelled. They got detention. They got expelled. They got the Board of Education, all this and that. But to be expelled, like, hey, I got to hang around at home. I got I to gotta hang around and hide out from my parents because they, I, I don't want them to know that I got expelled from school. But, you know, I got expelled from the presence of God. That's an even more terrible thing to be, in, you know, outside of the perfect will of God outside of his presence. And it was then that, that Jonah came and says, I will look. I will look towards you, Lord. I will look for your will. I will look 
for what your circumstances and what your plans are. He said, I have, uh, I, I descended. And in other words, I've come off my high horse, I've come off my high throne, and I've come back to that place of, uh, of, of, of humility. And humility really, or humbleness, just says that yeah, I put myself down on a lower position. And sometimes we can be on our, our, our high horse. And I think that's where that term comes. You're going, you're going to get knocked off your high horse, horse. In other words, you're filled with pride. You're filled with control. And I got it. I know. I, I can do it. And all this and that. And, you know, all the things of eye problems has, have caused us to be where hey, we've got to be placed in a, a, a position of humility, of worship before the Lord. And what greater place it is that we would be at the the foot of his cross, at the foot of his throne. And like eager kids seeking great and wonderful things that the Father can give to us. Uh, he says, uh, uh, but thou brought my life from the pit. And, you know, he recognized that only deliverance could only come from the Lord. And, you know, I don't know what situations, you know, we all face these situations. Oh, the things of... Uh, uh, I, I wrote to one of the brothers on the mainland in uh, San Diego, uh, or you know, he's in uh, he's in the desert now. I guess w waiting out the winter. But I said, oh, we, we're going through these aches and pains, like all of us, you know. And you know, yeah, we complain about it, but you know, in the Lord, we just kind of say, hey, God, you got it, and whatever happens, you know, you're in control, and we're gonna do our best, and of course, commit the rest. But I know that this, I know I recognize this, that you brought me, you delivered my life from the pit and you placed me upon a rock, upon the solid rock of the word of Jesus Christ. And I love the psalm that we're going through on Psalm uh, 119. We're going through that on Sunday mornings. Psalm 119 really speaks of the word of God. And how the word of God, you know, uh, uh, is that lamp unto our feet. How the word of God really is our, our, our direction. All the word of God. How, do, how does a young man keep his way? By keeping it according to the word of God. And I should say young man or young woman. Uh, you, we all qualify here. But how do we keep our, our, our way? We keep it according to thy word, O oh Lord. And, you know, these are the things that I think uh, Jonah was coming to that place. You brought my life from the pit. You delivered me. And he goes on in 7 to 9. He says, While I was fainting away, I remember the Lord, and my prayer came to thee in thy holy temple. For those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Uh, I, but I will sacrifice to thee with a voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. You know, here some have called this, uh, this short few verses a psalm of Jonah. Guys, it, it should fit right into the book of Psalms. This little three, uh, two, not even three verses, two verses. While I was fainting away, I remembered you, O Lord. And, uh, and my prayer came to thee into thy holy temple. And isn't it uh, a wonderful thing that Jesus Christ has made us, uh, made our way into the holy of holies through the veil when uh, he when when he died on that cross when he rose again guys that veil was torn in two from top to bottom and now we're told in the book of hebrews that we can enter boldly that throne room of grace for grace and mercy in, and help in time of need you know we can enter right into his presence with thanksgiving we can uh, enter right into his presence with our petitions and our requests we can enter right into his presence as we come and we ask lord uh, i need you to do battle on my behalf because the enemies come fast and furious against me and again uh, uh, there are those who regard those vain idols god but their faithfulness uh, forsake their faith uh, they, they forsake their faithfulness. And, you know, it's a call for us. It's a call that we wouldn't forsake God's word. And that's where Jonah was at. And, you know, that's where we all are at times. We forsake God's uh, word. And we know that uh, we're almost willful in our disobedience. We're almost willful in the hardness of our own heart as we, as we plunge headlong into areas that we shouldn't be. You know, it's a, it's a dangerous world out there. And God, like uh, that loving Heavenly Father, He wants to hang on to our, our hands and just lead us in those paths of righteousness where there's safety uh, and rest in Him, you know. And a lot of times, like kids, what do we do? We run away, right? Oh. 
it's like you're in this big department store and you hear it over the intercom, oh, did anybody lose a little boy? <laughs> you're on the first floor, oh, he's up on, he's here on the third floor, we got him. And you know, uh, uh, that's, that's how kids are. We have this tendency, we want to run away, we want to get away, we want that freedom. And a lot of times we want to just shake loose from the things of the Lord and says, I got him, I'm a big kid and you know, I know better. But again, uh, uh, we, we want to be faithful and not those who forget, forsake the faithfulness because God is faithful and uh, a lot of times, most of the time it's, it's not, uh, the faithfulness is not on him, it's really the lack of faithfulness is on us but he says, I will, fa I will sacrifice to thee with a voice of thanksgiving and you know uh, again, that's what we did this morning we do it so well and you know, the worship is so sweet the worship is so good as we enter his uh, gates with thanksgiving as we enter his courts with praise and and so much of it uh we 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 can sing over and over again and you know it becomes a precursor of what it's going to be like for all eternity uh in the presence of the lord as uh, i think uh we'll we'll hear the great hallelujah chorus as described uh, uh in the book of revelation guys and you know throughout the throughout the word of god you know we uh, like i told you guys before the other night in, in my bible i have all these little stars and all the choruses all the praise songs that we sing i say oh here's another one that we sing comes right out of the word of god and uh, it's such a blessing because as you read through the word of god you might just break out in a song of thanksgiving a song of worship in your heart because it's right there and we can't help ourselves and it, it's something silent within us as we come as we gather, as we worship the Lord. He noticed that I will sacrifice to thee with that voice of thanksgiving, to which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation uh, is, is the Lord. And you know, I, I, I think that yeah, Jonah came to that place where he probably had no money. The money was probably all rotten. He probably had no clothes. Or they were all digested from the gastric juices of the well, whatever it might be, guy. But I think that he says, hey, I, I'll, I'll pay, but I, I, I have nothing to give. I have only my life that I can give to you. I have only my heart that I can give to you. It's nothing that we can give. It's nothing that we can buy. It's nothing that we can earn our way or do this or do this act of contrition or repentance or penance. But it's only as we give our hearts and lives over to him. Salvation is from the Lord. I will pay, Lord. I'm going to lay, lay my life down before you. Uh, verse 10, the Lord, uh, then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Then and only then, guys, uh, was Jonah released from his uh, captivity. And sometimes we, we place ourselves in captivity ourselves. We become as those uh, with the currents and the billows pass, passing over us. And we become with the weeds wrapped around my head. You know, what, uh, as I was going through this, I thought that, hey, we don't have big seaweed here in Hawaii. It's not like we're in uh, Northern California where you see all the great kelp beds. And hey, even the guys, they surf in the, uh, surfing through the kelp beds and so on and so forth. We have Ogo. <laughs> we have Ogo and, you know, you can, uh, you can surf in the Ogo, body surf in the Ogo. You can take the Ogo home and eat it. <laughs> Chop it up, wash it up, chop it up, and put it in your pokey, you know, uh, uh, boil it or pickle it, whatever you want to do. And, uh, but, you know, as, as, uh, as you kind of think about it, hey, the, uh, out in the world, it's rough like that. We're just so entangled up. We're so in the dark. We're so uh, 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 overcome by the, the waves and the wind of doctrine, the waves and the wind of sinful mankind and the wind of the wind of the doctrine of the world, guys, uh, it comes upon us and we're just overwhelmed by all the things of the lies. And uh, I think if we stand the word of God, we'd be so much safer, guys, And uh, because it truly becomes that lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, second time, chapter 3, guys. Uh, uh, 
He says, uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, and according to the word of the Lord, and Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three-day walk around the city, and Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. After all the, uh, all the drama and discussion, guys, between the Lord and his wayward prophet, here the Jonah came to that place of uh, obeying the word of God. Uh, the word of God came to Jonah a second time. And, you know, sometimes uh, uh, I, I had one guy send me a message. He, says, uh, he said that I'm an only child, you know, hard head to... And he says that I had, to, uh, he had a, I had to learn the lesson two or three times before I got it. And this is exactly what Jonah was saying. Uh, uh, Jonah was thinking, the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And God is so gracious, guys, because, uh, uh, you know, we can be that hard-head kid. And we can be that one that God says, hey, I, 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 I treat you, uh, my son, my daughter, I love you. And I'm going to come to you again and again uh, with my reminder of my love and your, the call upon your life. And uh, he says, arise, you know, get up and go. And a lot of times uh, we, we fail to do that. We fail to follow the Lord's instructions. That word arise simply means get up. And then the second word, the second operative word is go. Get up and go. And, uh, uh, and thirdly, he says, uh, uh, yeah, Nineveh is this great city, but proclaim to uh, it's the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. Uh, you know, follow along with my instructions and give to them the word that I'm giving to you, I'm entrusting in, in, in to you. So Jonah rose, he went to Nineveh according to the word of God. Here he was in the will of God. Here he was in obedience to God's word. And we're told that Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. And literally, uh, I have a little footnote in my... Uh, my Bible, it says that it was a great city to God. In other words, God cared for these, these cruel, vicious people, these people who had uh, gone away from him, these people who had treated his own people, uh, the Jews, with great cruelty, uh, with great uh, uh, viciousness and uh, great passion uh, to go ahead and torment uh, God's people. It was an exceedingly great city, a great city to God, three days walk around uh, the whole city a day's walk in those days guys was considered about 20 miles uh, average uh, uh an average person and his family maybe they could go an average day's walk was 20 miles so when you think that hey, it was three days walk hey, the circumference of the city was uh, 60 miles around uh, uh scholars tell us that the population of the city was uh 120,000. So I was just asking Levon on the way over here, oh, how big is the city that John lives in? Uh, and she said that it's a big city. And uh, she, she Googled it, she Siri'd it, whatever she did. But uh, in 2019, uh, it was a uh, population was about 68,000. And it's grown since then. So, you know, I'm sure it's uh, grown a, a few since then. But she said it's a big city. So when you think that, hey, here's a city 60 miles around, 120,000 people. It was really a large, large city. Uh, uh, and Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. He cried out and said to them, Yet 40 days, Nineveh, Nineveh will be overthrown. And here's this crazy guy. I don't know what he looked like. And some Bible teachers said that he was all bleached white from the, uh, the, uh, the gastric juices of the whale, whatever it might have been. He might have been naked and... Uh, I read a story about a sailor who was um, literally, uh, he was blown off a portion of the ship, the Arizona, during the World War II attack, the December 7 attack. He was blown out of his clothes. He swam to Fort Island uh, naked, and then they wrapped him up in a blanket. And, uh, uh, but, you know, he was literally blown out of his clothes, you know, uh, no clothes on him as he was blown off the ship into the water and he made his way, he swam over to Fort Island. I think they, they had a story about him because uh, he had a kind of a storied career in the Navy. He even uh, fought in Vietnam uh, uh, and they had a picture of him. He, you know, he looked kind of buff back then with his M14 and 
a sidearm arm on him on the radio. Uh, but they, they had him interred, his ashes, his wishes were to be buried with his shipmates on the Arizona. So he was one of the guys they put on the Arizona on this last uh, uh, commemorative event uh, that they had. But uh, again, uh, you know, uh, th like, like this man who was blown out of his clothes and ended up uh, on Ford Island, where a lot of the Navy families live, see, uh, they, uh, they, come, they came, they wrapped him with uh, blankets. Uh, I don't know what Jonah looked like, but uh, his message was well received. Nineveh will be overthrown in 40 days. You know, it was a real message of hey, get your life right with God. And uh, the people of Nineveh believed uh, and, uh, uh, in God and they called a fast, verse nine, 5, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne. He laid aside his robe from him. He covered himself with ash cloth, with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. And uh, he issued a proclamation. It said in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. Let men call upon God earnestly that we may turn from the wicked way from the violence which is in his hands. And who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so we shall not perish. One of the cruelest, most wicked people came under a conviction. There was great conviction to the greatest, to the least. You know, we see the king, he, uh, uh, he arose, uh, 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 he laid aside his robe, he covered himself with sackcloth and ashes and sat down on the ashes, you know. Uh, it became a thing where there was a lot of action uh, taking place. Uh, they were brought to a place of repentance, and this becomes one of the greatest miracles in, uh, in the entire Bible and the greatest testimony of God's love and grace towards any people group, guys. And, you know, it, it just says that, you know, as we said, God doesn't care if we white, black, purple, pink, uh, uh, yellow with green polka dots, whatever it is, God's love for mankind is the same. He loves us. He loves one. He loves us just as we are. Uh, and God's grace was uh, not only for the Jews, but for all people, Jew and Gentile alike, guys. In 10, he goes on, uh, uh, and when God saw their deeds, they turned from their wicked way, and then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared uh, he would bring upon them. He did not do it. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Hey, what's with this guy Jonah? And I know, I know that Jonah, Jonah was a man of God, a prophet of God. Jonah, uh, at times, he, he came to repentance. He, uh, he uh, uh, turned back to the Lord. But here it is, you know, uh, sometimes, um, you know, man is like that, guys. We have a dislike for someone or some person or some people group or whatever it might be. And we might pray for them, but it's almost begrudging. We might uh, obey God, but it's really begrudgingly because you don't like what God wants to do. God's wrath was turned, and we see Jonah, Jonah's disapproval. And how often do we disapprove what God wants to do and what God wa wa will do? But uh, you see, he desired the Assyrian destruction rather than their salvation. And what a, what a tough place to be in, yeah. Could we ever be in that place where we say, oh, I'd rather see that guy fail than succeed, you know. I'd rather see uh, this happen than uh, the, the goodness of God shine through. And this is where Jonah was at. He said that he hated the Assyrian people so greatly because of their cruelty towards the people of Israel. He said, hey, Lord, why don't, why don't you just snuff them out rather than save them? But he goes on, he says, uh, uh, I, I, and I prayed to the Lord and says, please, Lord, was not this what I did while I was still in my, uh, was this still uh, what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that thou art gracious and compassionate, uh, God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. Therefore, now, God, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And Jonah was in a real bad place because he just says that, hey, God, you're so gracious, you're so compassionate, you're so slow to anger, you're so filled with loving kindness. And, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm so bad. I'm such, such a rat. I'm such a dirty guy. Why don't you just take my life, Lord? And uh, 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 Jonah was so disturbed. And rather than rejoicing over God's great work of faithfulness, he said, hey, just take my life. Just off me, Lord. You know, I, I'm not worthy. And uh, uh, I wonder how many Christians uh, he's actually, the, the enemy has actually said uh, to them, hey, why don't you just take your life? Why don't you just end it all? Why don't you just uh, run from God? Why don't you just ignore him and go back to the way you were? Uh, I, I wonder about that because the enemy often wants to see, tell us, oh, you're so dumb, yeah? You found that you could have you kept it all. And yet you, you gave it back. And uh, uh, how, how stupid are you? And, uh, and uh, the enemy loves to rob us of our joy. He loves to rob us of what God is doing. He loves to rob us of all the great and wonderful things God is, uh, has done. In, in 4 to 11, the Lord says, uh, do you have a good reason to be angry? <laughs> Don't you just love God? He's just so candid. I, do you have a good reason to be angry? Hey, what about you? You have a good reason to be mad. <laughs> you have a good reason to be jealous. Do you have a good reason to be bitter? Do you have a good reason to wallow in all the hurt? You know, and, and uh, sometimes God, you know, he asks those tough questions. It's like John asking uh, these tough questions to the people he loved, the kids he loved. Uh, and that love, that, that love is tough. And God is pretty tough on Jonah. And this is God's love. So Jonah went up from the city and he sat east of it and he made a shelter for himself and sat uh, in it under the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. He was probably waiting, okay, Lord, I'm waiting for the lightning bolts. So the Lord appointed a plan and it grew over Jonah to be a shade over his head, to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plan. But God appointed a worm. And, uh, and when dawn came the next day, it attacked the plant and it withered. And it came about when the sun came up and God appointed a scorching east wind that the sun beat down on Jonah's head. So he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. And God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry uh, 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 about the plant? And he says, I have a good reason to be angry even to death. And the Lord says, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not, uh, you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, when, which came up overnight and perished overnight. And should I not have compa compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not, do not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as many animals. Here again, he's asking Jonah, do you have a good reason? To feel this way and you know the the question really uh as i i said that hey, i want to go through jonah because i want to illustrate the fact that jonah was a guy on the run disobedient to god but you know when you look at these questions it begs for us to look at it ourselves do we have a good reason to be where we're at and uh, i don't want to miss the point that god was bringing to salvation to many in nineveh as much as he desired that his love for Jonah, guys, his ministry to that hardened heart, I believe was just as important to the Lord. And you know, it's just as important for us today, guys. And, um, uh, but here in Jonah, we saw the reluctant prophet, a, re a reluctant minister of God. Yet the Lord was uh, not only interested in the people of Nineveh, but he was interested in Jonah. And you know, we might be reluctant, we might be uh, resistant, uh, we might be, uh, uh, disinterested in, in a certain people or whatever it might be. But God really is interested in those people, but he's really interested in us. John is in the same way, guys, very interested in the people he called to, uh, he, uh, he was called to uh, in his ministry, especially to the seven churches in Revelation that started off well, yet many were in danger of going off course and actually away from the Lord. John spent a lot of time in Ephesus, and you're going to notice that Ephesus was a prominent church, uh, the, the Church of Ephesians, uh, in Asia Minor. And this is the church that one of the first churches he addresses. In Revelation 2, John, uh, you, you guys can turn there. We're going to try and get through this in a timely fashion, guys. But in Revelation 2, John first pens the words of our Lord in verse 4. 
chapter 2, verse 4, but I have these things against you. Uh, you have left your first love. And, you know, he's speaking right to the church of, uh, of Ephesus, of Ephesians. Uh, he says, uh, though, uh, though doing much right, uh, these, uh, there was a call on the church to repent. You know, they had started off well. They do, they're doing all the right things. They hate all the false teachers. They, hate, they do all the good works. Yet, uh, for some reason, in all the good, goodness and all the good things they had done, they had left their first love. And, uh, you know, I, I want to say that the, John's first letter really speaks of communion with God, communion with God, fellowship with God. He uses that word abide. He uses the word believe. Remember the word believe in the Gospel of John. Some 99 times he used the, uh, the word believe or a derivative of the word believe as he wrote the Gospel of John. Now here the emphasis is to abide with God, to have communion, to have fellowship, to have all things in common. And sometimes it's, a, it's just a matter of, hey, I want to hang out with you, Lord. I want to rest in you. I want to worship you. I want to just lay back and just enjoy your love and your warmth and your blessing rather than saying, I got to be busy and doing this or that. I got to hate this, uh, this false teachers and so on and so forth. But in 2.14, Revelation 2.14, it was, I have a few things against you. You see this church had fallen, in, uh, fallen into the teaching of Balaam. He's writing to Pergamos. He says, uh, the church had fallen into the teaching of Balaam, bringing a stumbling block to God's people acts of immorality and eating unclean things, sacrifice to idols. And when you think about that, it, you, you might say, hey, Russell, we don't eat anything uh, sacrificed to unclean idols. But, you know, what, 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 do the, what are the things of the idols we have uh, in our own life? And, you know, I, I, I've often said that, you know, I had a motorcycle years ago. I used to sit, at, uh, sit down in front of it on a little stool and just polish out the engine. Uh, late at night, and I had I had that engine polished out. It was so buffed out, it was so nice. But I said that hey, it's like I'm uh, bowing down before this little idol, and the bike is so fabulous. It looks so good. But hey, what what if I was uh, really uh, really reading the Word of God, or you know, doing something beneficial to the Word of God? But it could be that acts of immorality, eating unclean things. The things of immorality not only speaks of uh, acts of sexual acts or acts outside of marriage or things like that, but the immoral things of the world that creep into our lives at times, you know, the things of immorality. In 225, the message was to Thyra Tyra, what you have, hold fast until I come. And sounding, uh, sounding like uh, the Holy Spirit in Hebrews, guys, the exhortation to hold fast against the teachings of uh, Jezebel uh, uh, unto acts of immorality and adultery again, probably both physical and spiritual. Uh, these are the, uh, those who do not hold to his, his, uh, this teaching. Verse 25, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until you come. You know, they were holding fast until the, the message of salvation, the gospel of grace of Jesus Christ. To the message, the, the message to the church of Sardis in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, you have... Uh, the name that you are alive, but you are already dead. You know, and uh, Sardis was a church, again, uh, maybe filled with good works. Uh, 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 he says, wake up and strengthen the things that remain. He says, you have received and heard. What you have seen and heard, keep it and repent, uh, was God's call for Sardis. Uh, uh, you know, it, it was a thing that hey, these churches started off so well. Remember, this was in about A.D. 90, A.D. 85, A.D. 90, A.D. 95. There was a great persecution that was going to come upon the church with the, uh, with the Roman Empire at that particular time. The, the persecution was ready to come hard and fast. And, and the call, the message to the church was, hey, hold on, hold fast to the things of Jesus. Let go of the things of the immor immorality and the things sacrificed to idols. Uh, in 3.15, he says uh, to the church at uh, 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 Laodicea, you are neither hot, uh, you are neither cold nor, nor hot uh, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And what a, what a picture that is, yeah. 
Oh, I got some uh, lukewarm tea. It doesn't taste so good, so I'm just going to spit it out when I walk out the door or whatever it might be. But to think that uh, the Lord would say, speak to a church that, yeah, because you're not hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And it was a lukewarm church. And sometimes we, we got to ask, hey, what is my temperature? It's, it's like walking into the room and saying, hey, we got to take this temperature. Oh, okay, we can go through that. And, and, uh, but, you know, the temperature of our fervor with the Lord, the temperature, are we hot for the Lord? Are we hot for his things? Are we hot for his tenets? Are we hot for his proof? To the church in Smyrna in, in 210, be faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. You know, he had nothing wrong about the church uh, to say about the church of Smyrna. They were doing everything right. But yet the, the little church of Smyrna, Smyrna he says, uh, you're, you're, you're poor, but you're rich in the things of the Lord. And that's all that mattered to, to the Lord. You know, they might have been the suffering church. They might have been the poor church. But uh, in that, he says, you guys are rich beyond what you can think or imagine. Uh, do not fear what you are about to suffer. He tells them right up front, you guys as Christians, you're going to suffer for my name's sake. The same John who wrote uh, First, Second, and Third John was the same instrument used by the Lord to pen the book of Revelation. While others, uh, while in prison in the, uh, island of, uh, on the island of Patmos, off the coast of Asia, right off of uh, uh, if, uh, Ephesus, actually, guys, he, as Jonah, in, in prison in the belly of the whale, would be used mightily by the Lord. They were kind of similar. Jonah was in prison in the belly of the whale. John was in prison on the island of Patmos. John would write his first letter to a people in danger of growing cold in faith. First John was written to a people in danger of going, growing cold in faith in their relationship and commitment to the Lord. He sums it up in chapter 3, 23. We end here. Look at First John with me, guys. Uh, I'm glad that you guys are bearing with me. First John 3. We conclude today's message. Uh, really in 23 and 24 this is the commandment that we believe in the name of his son jesus christ and love one another just as he commanded us and the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him and uh, we know that uh, by this he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us you know here's that word again it's the word abide and that word abide you know we've often defined that very simply as to stay or to remain. In other words, hey, we're in the house of the Lord. We're in the arms of the Lord. We're in uh, uh, his, his uh, gates, uh, his temple gates, his courts of praise. We come, we worship, we love him. He loves us. We abide with him. He abides with us. Uh, and, and, and this uh, we know it's by the spirit he has given us. Why don't we pray? Father God, we do want to thank you for this morning, Lord. And as we've been all over the place from the Old Testament to the New Testament, Lord, uh, uh, we com come back to that simple conclusion that uh, the one who uh, believes in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and as we love one another, Lord, and as we abide in him, he abides in us. And, uh, uh, and we know this by the spirit that he's given to us, Lord. Uh, we thank you. We praise you. Tough messages to the churches in Revelation. And John had a tough, tough message, message as he wrote First John, trying to get the church to wake up and to uh, come back into line, that they would abide and believe in the Lord and uh, love one another as Christ loved us all, Lord. We thank you. We praise you for the many warnings and the many instructions you bring through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Any man.